Hello, everyone. My name is Grant Robertson. Um, I'm a life sciences consultant at IBM Watson Health. Um, part of my role is to work with the life science organizations across Europe to um, essentially determine suitable use cases for the Watson Health cognitive technology. Um, now, the purpose of my talk today is to give you an overview of Watson for Drug Discovery, um, which is essentially a cognitive solution that we're applying to research and development. Um, but before I do that, um, I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview as to what Watson Health actually is and why we were initiated in the first place. So if we look at the healthcare and life sciences domain, um, we're seeing an explosion of uh, health-related and life sciences data. Now, most of this, or a majority, around 80%, is what we call unstructured data. Um, and this differs to kind of what we see in uh, kind of traditional rows and columns, which is easy to interpret um, by programmable systems. So this unstructured data can come in many forms, such as within a patient's electronic medical record, uh, free text, data from wearables, genomics. Uh, if we're looking at the life sciences, then all of the uh, scientific literature that's being published. Um, and as I've said, it's very difficult for systems up until now to kind of interpret that data and draw meaning from it. Um, but Watson is different in that it can interpret this data. So it's what we call a cognitive system. And by that, I mean it can do three things. So it can understand, reason, and learn, much like human cognition can. Um, so if we just look at that a little bit deeper, so when I say understand, um, there's uh, something called natural language processing that exists within uh, Watson, uh, if we're talking about free text. And it can understand not only kind of the key words within scientific literature, if we're thinking about R&D, but it can understand the ways in which they relate to one another. So it can understand context when it's looking at um, a set text. Uh, second is the ability to reason. So there's a number of algorithms that exist within Watson which can um, essentially generate hypotheses as to what the best answer is based on the information that it has. And then thirdly is the ability to learn. So there's machine learning that exists within Watson um, so it can continually improve over time. Um, now, we're avoiding using the word AI to describe Watson. Um, we're calling it augmented intelligence. Uh, and what I mean by that is it's not designed to replace uh, physicians or scientists, um, but it's uh, supposed to supplement uh, and inform the work that they do. So if we think about the area of oncology, um, we've developed a solution called Watson for Oncology, which can take the patient's electronic medical record and then, through Watson's ability to understand, can understand the context of that record, uh, and then it matches up um, a personalized treatment recommendation for that given patient. And that's because of Watson's ability to read and understand all of the medical um, literature that's being used to train the system. So what that means in effect is that the treatment recommendations being given to patients are not based on any bias, and they're completely evidence-based. Um, just in terms of other areas in which we're working, so uh, within the life sciences, um, R&D is obviously something I'm covering today, um, but also there's a great need for this kind of technology within pharmacovigilance, um, because there's many unstructured drug safety reports um, that come through to pharmaceutical companies, and you need a way to quickly interpret those. So I guess the key message to leave you with is that, you know, it's the ability to scale. Um, that's where Watson is so important, because it has kind of an unlimited potential to read and digest this unstructured and structured data and draw meaning from it. Okay, so the focus of my presentation today is something called Watson for Drug Discovery. Um, so this is a solution that we're applying to uh, R&D. Uh, more specifically, it can be used to um, identify new disease pathways, um, or identify novel drug targets, uh, as well as repurposing existing drugs uh, within alternative areas. So at the core of Watson for Drug Discovery is the knowledge. Um, so as I said earlier, Watson has the ability to integrate uh, both on structured data, uh, also with structured data as well. Uh, so existing within the platform is 
all of the data or scientific literature that exists on uh, Medline, um, as well as uh, data from chemical databases, patents, uh, and some full text medical journals as well. So each time a scientific researcher makes a query within Watson, um, Watson is reading all of this. So it's reading those millions of articles in a matter of seconds uh, and drawing conclusions based on that. Um, there's also the ability for life science organizations to ingest their own data as well. Um, and that's something that we're doing with Pfizer in the US. Um, so the second key part to Watson for drug discovery is obviously the cognitive layer. Um, so as I said earlier, natural language processing um, is key. So at the moment, Watson for Drug Discovery can recognize uh, genes, drugs, diseases, and chemicals within the literature. Um, but not, not only that, it can understand the ways in which they relate to one another. Uh, and that's important because it's pulling forward um, into the queries all of the potential relationships that exist. So it's a very useful way to explore what is already known. But then to add to that, um, within the tool, there's the ability to make predictions as well. So there's some machine learning capabilities which um, essentially learn based on what has been published previously or that exists within the client's data. Um, so just to give you an example there, so we worked with uh, Barrow Neurological Institute last year, and they wanted to um, try and determine new genes related to ALS, so a form of motor neuron disease. Um, so what we did there is we took, uh, as a training set, um, all of the genes which were known to be related to that disease. Um, so that existed in kind of the training set, and that trained the machine learning model within Watson. And then we then presented Watson with 1,500 candidate genes that they wanted to prioritize um, in terms of where to focus their attention. Um, so what Watson did in that case is it basically creates what we call a text fingerprint for every entity. So it's looking at each of those entities that we're inputting, uh, and then essentially quantifying all of the words which are used to describe those given entities. Um, and then it basically conducts a similarity analysis based on those words which are being used to describe each of the entities. And kind of the rationale behind that is that the function of a given gene or drug, uh, it's kind of embedded in the way in which it's being described in the literature. Um, and because obviously Watson is able to read these massive amounts of data, it's in a way which a human may not be able to easily distinguish themselves. Uh, and then the third kind of component to uh, Watson for Drug Discovery is the ability to create dynamic visualizations. So the researcher has many different ways to kind of interact with that data uh, and then look at the underlying evidence um, for that. Um, okay, so I wanted the purpose of today to be a demo. So um, if I go across here, and then this opens. OK, great. Um, I'll have to kneel down. <laughs> OK, so for the purpose of this, um, I'm going to focus on Alzheimer's disease. Um, so essentially, I'm going to show you three tools today um, because of the time that I have. Um, and these have been the three which have been, I would say, most powerful with our clients. Um, so the first tool I'm going to show you is called Explore an Entity. Um, and this is really kind of a holistic search where you can look for what is known within the current domain in which you're searching. So if I just type in here Alzheimer's. And what we can see, so Watson has kind of changed that into bold. And what that essentially means is Watson recognizes that as an entity in which it was trained. Um, but you can then also choose the source. And then if I click Explore. Um, so one thing I also haven't highlighted, so not only can Watson recognize the entities of interest, but it can understand all of the synonyms that are being used to describe it as well. Uh, and as I was saying earlier, it can understand context. So for instance, if I was typing in AD, uh, and part of my query was um, obviously Alzheimer's disease, then it's going to pull forward those results. Um, but if I was searching for genes related to autism uh, and I put in AD, then Watson would be able to understand the context of that and bring that forward. Um, so what we can see here is just very much a high-level search, and you can see all of the um, published literature that exists um, in terms of the genes, drugs, diseases, 
uh, as well as chemicals and journals as well. Um, so based on that, you can just see a high-level trend in terms of what's being published. Um, but then what's really interesting is you can take this and then put it into the uh, Entity Explorer. And this is when you can then start to see the ways in which these entities relate to one another. Um, so for the purpose of this, I'll just focus on two of these genes, uh, so APP and Presenilin 1. And if I go to Explorer Network... And then explore. Okay, so we can see that Watson has um, essentially created a knowledge graph based on everything that's known within that area. And hopefully you can see it. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so what we can see here, so these were the two search terms that I um, looked for, so Presenilin 1 and APP. And we can see all of these various different nodes that surround those given entities. So this is basically showing all of the literature that's being published that supports those relationships. And if I just hover over one of these, we can see that there's two documents uh, existing within the scientific literature that supports that relationship. Um, what you can then do as well within the tool, so you can focus on specific relationships. So for instance, I may want to look at, I don't know, binding. Um, you can add that here. And we can see that's obviously just uh, drastically changed the result size. Um, but then if I just uh, hover on APOE, and I'll just show you the way in which Watson is understanding and annotating that literature. Um, so let's just click on this. Um, if I just select all of these. Um, so what we see in this first bit is where Watson has understood that relationship. So we can see here uh, APOE uh, binds APP, and then there's the ability to then jump to that. Um, so this is the abstract. Um, and we can see, so annotated in blue are all of the genes. We can see drugs in blue. Um, but you can see that Watson is not just picking up those entities, but it's understanding the way in which they relate to one another. So it's a very powerful tool to explore what is known within a given area. Um, if I just go back... Um, and then something else. So I wanted to investigate the link between APP and Presenilin 1, so if I just um, get rid of this <coughs> again and then you can focus on those two specific entities. And so let's do that. Um, and now we can see the links between those two genes of interest. <coughs> um, now, for the purpose of this, I'm just going to focus on one of these, so TP53, um, which is a gene implicated in cancer, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, if I then open that up, um, what we can see here is then the way in which they relate to one another and how Watson is um, kind of deriving those relationships. Um, so let's just focus on this. Okay, so again, we can see that Watson has understood um, the entities, but also the way in which they relate to one another. Um, now, in terms of the annotation, um, so there's machine learning annotation that exists within that. Um, so what that means is, as new literature is being published, Watson is annotating and, and extracting that information. So there's not someone on the IBM side going through and manually annotating all of this. So there's machine learning that exists within the annotation side. Um, now, the final tool I want to show you in is what I would say is the most powerful tool within the system is predictive analytics. Um, so if you think back to what I said at the start, this is a way to quickly prioritize um, genes or drugs, chemicals of interest. Um, so for instance, I worked with a pharma company who wanted, uh, they had a drug within a set indication and they wanted to repurpose it for uh, alternative uh, cancer indications. So what they did here is they put the training set where all of the gene targets for that given drug. And then we then presented Watson with all of the cancer indications that they wanted to prioritize. Um, so if we think back to what I said earlier, Watson is then basically looking for the words which are being used to describe each of those in the literature uh, and looking for patterns um, between those to then rank those. Um, so I should have this here. 
Okay, so we'll stick with the Alzheimer's um, theme. So let's just copy that. Um, so what you would put in, oops, what you would put in the training set are a series of entities with a known function. Um, so in this case, we're putting um, genes which are known to be related to Alzheimer's disease, um, and then the candidate set. So this is typically um, the list that the client or researcher wants to prioritize in terms of where to focus their attentions. Um, so if I just then add that here. Uh, and then rank. Um. Okay. So we can see Watson has created two outputs. <coughs> what we can see on the left is um, each of these candidate sets ranked in terms of similarity to the overall training set. Uh, and if you think about what I was describing with Barrow Neurological Institute, um, this were the genes that they used as part of their prioritization. Um, and what we can see is that there's a number of these genes clustering together. Um, so green are our training set, um, and obviously because they have a similar function, they're clustering together in terms of similarity, so there's nothing surprising there. But what we can see is that there are a number of red nodes from our candidate set that are clustering near uh, those green nodes. Um, and that's because the words being used to describe them in the literature are similar, so they may therefore have a similar function. Um, and one point to clarify, so there doesn't need to be a directly mentioned relationship um, in the literature for Watson to kind of say that these are similar, because it's just looking for patterns in the way in which they're being described. Um, now, another thing that um, obviously is a big question here is how are we validating this? Um, so there's three different ways in which we validate uh, these models. Uh, so the first is um, what we call a retrospective analysis. Uh, so with Barrow, we um, essentially took all of the literature prior to 2012 uh, and excluded some of the genes which were discovered beyond that point. Uh, we then run the analysis, and then if it's valid, you would then expect those discovered after that point to be ranked highly. Uh, in that case, they were. Uh, a second way in which we can validate this is through prospective lab tests. So with Barrow, we then um, <coughs> conducted some wet lab tests and we identified that 9 out of 10 were indeed uh, altered in ALS disease. Uh, but what we also found were five entirely new uh, binding proteins. Uh, and then the final way, uh, which is within this tool, is a statistical validation. So this is where you take a third of your um, known entities and basically add it to your candidate set. Uh, and if it's a valid model, then you would expect it to have um, a high p-value. Um, so I'll just run that now. Mm -hmm. So we can see in this case um, it's high. Um, okay, I think that's all I've got time for. So um, yeah, that was a very quick run through of Watson for drug discovery. Um, if any of you have thought any of any potential use cases while you've been watching that, then I'm here all day today. So please um, grab some time with me. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>